All right, everyone, welcome to another edition of the Fellows Forum. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Aman Chohan, who is an Associate Professor of Medical Oncology at the University of Miami Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center. And there, he's the leader of our Neuroendocrine Tumor Program, as well as the co-director of our Theranostics Program. Dr. Chohan, welcome. Thank you so much, Sam. How are you doing? Doing well. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time and energy today. Um, I wanted to ask you a few questions about your tumor uh, type of focus, which is the neuroendocrine tumors. Um, so with that being said, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Dr. Chohan, could you tell us a little bit about your interest in this tumor type, how that came about either in your personal or professional life? Yes, I think it was uh, by chance. Um, when I first started, uh, you know, I was uh, doing a combined internal medicine pediatric residency with the intention to specialize in uh, AYA. And that's why I was kind of seeing the full spectrum of the, you know, during my residency. But in uh, New Orleans, we had a very strong neuroendocrine cancer program. Uh, and I got plugged in with uh, some of the mentors there. And it was just fantastic to kind of see their passion in neuroendocrine cancer. Uh, my earlier publications and research work um, was centered around neuroendocrine cancer. And then that's how slowly I gravitated more and more towards neuroendocrine cancers. Uh, some of my early mentors during residency were all uh, well-known surgical oncologists with specialization in neuroendocrine cancers. And when the time came to do a fellowship, they asked me to go to University of Kentucky, where I had two, two really uh, world-renowned neuroendocrine cancer specialists, Dr. Lowell Anthony and Dr. Ed Volan, uh, who uh, was uh, there at that time. And they took me under their wing and trained me. So during my fellowship uh, with Hemong Fellowship, I had a dedicated sub-fellowship in neuroendocrine cancer. So I had a NETS continuity clinic right from the day one of my fellowship. I stayed back in uh, University of Kentucky for my early career years, uh, focused uh, practice on all spectrum of neuroendocrine cancer from low grade NETS to high grade small cell, large cell neuroendocrine carcinomas. So that's how sort of my journey took me from New Orleans to Kentucky and now in Miami. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Hearing about a continuity clinic focused on nets seems pretty atypical. So it's great that you were able to have uh, such a good experience from the get-go. You know, I think a lot of the themes you just focused on really focus on the importance of mentorship. And we've uh, covered this in previous episodes of the Fellows Forum, but really it's all about getting those experts in the field um, to kind of help train you and help guide you in uh, specialized career paths. And to see your career taking off is uh, really awesome to see. So thank you for all you do for mentoring uh, us fellows as well. Thank you. Well, yeah, one of the things it's very crucial uh, is to try to find your focus early. The longer you are able to kind of stick in your uh, you know area of interest, the the better off you are because you get more opportunities to work, publish, network, and find your footing, uh, be it through, uh, you know, uh, networking at different committees or, you know, uh, you're uh, uh, at national levels. Uh, so, so it's really important if you can find that interest area sooner, the better. Awesome advice, not only for Hemonc Fellows, but really any kind of subspecialty of medicine. So thank you for that. Very good. All right. So the next question we wanted to ask you, Dr. Chohan, is what is one recent clinical advancement you'd like to highlight in the neuroendocrine cancer space? Neuroendocrine cancer is a rare cancer. Unfortunately, like our lung cancer colleagues uh, or breast cancer colleagues and so many other common cancers, we had not been able to do a whole lot of uh, cutting edge uh, research for a really long period of time. And fortunately, that changed in the last three to five years where we have a slew of new drugs and FDA approvals. In just last 12 months itself, we have some really exciting studies that have been positive. So to pick uh, one of the three positive studies is difficult. So I'm going to say a little bit about all of those three. It's very important. The most recent was the Netter 2 last week at GI Asco in San Francisco, where uh, Dr. Simran Singh uh, showed that the PRRT or Lutathera, Lutetium 178 which is a radiopharmaceutical directed against somatostatin receptor positive disease, works really well uh, in higher grade neuroendocrine tumors. So these are 
uh, neuronicin tumors with KI67 uh, uh, on a higher range, higher grade two, and definitely grade three well deficient neuronicin tumor. So as compared to somatostatin analog, um, you know, th there was a significant improvement in progression-free survival. So that was really good to know. This was probably the first prospective study showing a uh, role of lutathera or PRRT agent in the frontline setting in these higher grade, well different neuroendocrine tumors. A um, couple of months before that, Dr. Jennifer Chan uh, from Dana-Farber presented data on cabinet study. That was a randomized phase three study on cabozantinib in metastatic progressive well different neuronicin tumor, and that was a resounding success story as well. In fact, they had to stop the study sooner because it was unethical to randomize to uh, control placebo arm. Um, so very, very positive study with significant improvement in responses as well as pro uh, progression-free survival. And the third study, which uh, I'm sort of associated with, uh, the data is not officially um, divulged. It'll be uh, presented at upcoming ENATS in Vienna, However, uh, the, the sponsors have released a press release. And so pal phase two study, and they've revealed that it's a positive study. Uh, it is a significant advance in our field because uh, for the longest time, we had sandostatin and landriotide. Those are two great drugs. These are somatostatin analogs, but you have to inject it once a month. Now we finally have an oral alternative to somatostatin analogs. So pal is an oral somatostatin analog and based on the, the data, which is in public domain, it is a positive phase to study. So we look forward to revealing of the finer data in upcoming ENAR. So a lot is happening, Sam. Sorry, I cannot pick one. <laughs> That's certainly okay. That's better for patients when there's not only one thing to pick. You know, I, I've heard so much from what you've just shared. We've got um, advancements with uh, radionucleotides, TKIs, new novel somatostatin analogs. And this really adds to what we've known previously as somewhat limited options, right? The um, injectable somatostatin analogs, some chemotherapy drugs like everolimus and that sort of thing. So of course, these are wonderful advancements and we can't wait to see the final data, especially for the third trial that you mentioned today. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, very good. So while we're on that kind of research um, note, um, Dr. Chohan, what is one research interest or advancement you'd like to share in relation to the neuroendocrine space? So um, within the spectrum of neuroendocrine cancer, where on the uh, slow-growing slow end of spectrum lies your typical carcinoid, atypical carcinoid, or what we like to call them well-differentiated grade one, two, or three neuroendocrine tumors, on the other more aggressive end of spectrum for these neuroendocrine cancer lies the poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas. We like to call them NECs. There are two different flavors of it, small cell and large cell. You all heard about small cell lung cancer. That's the commonest type of high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma. The high-grade poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma is critical unmet need. And, and uh, we've really struggled to kind of improve five-year outcomes, which are still unfortunately in the range for 10 to 12%, even in the era of immunotherapy. Um, so six, slightly better as compared to 5% uh, without, uh, you know, a Tacentric or a Dervilumab. Uh, but we have a long way to go. So this is an area where I think we are seeing some significant advances and I'm very, very optimistic. And this is a drug which um, belongs to a DLL3 target bite category. So DLL3 is a delta light ligand. It's a notch pathway ligand, which is heavily expressed in high-grade neuroendocrine cancers, be it small cell lung cancer or extrathoracic high-grade neuroendocrine cancers. Um, the phase one study, uh, you know, done by various companies were revealed at ACR, ASCO, and World Lung Conference last year and looks extremely promising with uh, objective responses from 20% to all the way, some studies report 35, 40% responses, which is fantastic considering this was a very refractory third, fourth, fifth line patients where traditional therapies have a response rate in range of 10%. Um, not only the response rates were impressive, it's the durability of responses. I part I was able to uh, enroll some of the patients in early phase studies and I've seen it firsthand, uh, these complete responses and really durable responses. So this class of drug is a 
by specific T cell engage or the by targeting the DLL3 positive cancer cells, I think is looking very promising, uh, serving a, a, a critical unmet need. Um, and I'm very, very optimistic about this uh, drug development story yet to be unfolded in various phase three studies. Super exciting news. And just as a reminder for fellows and other trainees on the call, those bites really act just like they sound. They kind of grab a T cell and then the target of interest and bring them together to kind of eradicate things. So it's a very novel mechanism. And more importantly, if it leads to improved outcomes, PFS, durability of response, et cetera, these are things that would be crucially needed in the clinic like Dr. Chohan was alluding to. So thanks for sharing that information with us today. Absolutely. Awesome, Dr. Chohan. That reaches uh, the end of my prepared comments and questions. Is there anything else you'd like to share in this space for uh, fellows and other trainees who are listening today? Yes, I think just a small uh, sneak peek into the future of oncology. Uh, just a little uh, clickbait for you there. <laughs> you know, we've all seen um, the wave of immunotherapy. I was a fellow uh, and when the whole immune checkpoint inhibitor story was uh, being revealed. Um, we had some fantastic investigators who won Nobel Prize. Uh, and then the whole immune checkpoint inhibitor took over the world of oncology from one drug to now several drugs, from one indication to now several, several indications. So it works really well. Moving forward, what I foresee is that we will see in next decade the, the era of radiopharmaceutical or what we call theranostics. Uh, it is, uh, you know, a field of medicine where we try to find a, a target of interest in a particular cancer, uh, in prostate cancer, might be PSMA, in neuroendocrine cancers, somatostatin receptors, but there could be so many others, fibroblast activating protein in pancreatic cancer, integrin in breast cancer, et cetera, and so and so forth. Once you have a target, you can link a radiopharmaceutical uh, on uh, to a drug which attaches to that target and then you can scan the patient and look at the tumors and the, uh, the distribution of that target. Unlike the current precision medicine where we are dependent on a biopsy uh, of that one particular spot, here you get a real-time view of how the tumor targets is expressed and what quantity and what, what all uh, burden of disease. And then all you have to do is flip the radiopharmaceutical from a imaging isotope to a heavy duty isotope, be it a beta emitter like lutetium or alpha emitter based on actinium or lead. And it then is the same concept. So a diagnostic agent become a therapeutic agent. So theragnostics. And I foresee that this class of drug is going to see uh, a meteoric rise. A lot of small and big pharmaceutical industries have heavily invested in it. It's a multi-billion dollar industry now. And uh, what is exciting to see is that uh, that drugs like Lutathera and Pluvicto popularized it, but it's kind of moving forward to various solid cancers, the common cancers. And I think it's going to uh, uh, take the oncology community um, you know, uh, by a surprise uh, and a pleasant surprise. Oh, it, it's very exciting indeed. Uh, while we are here in the era of precision oncology to see things kind of evolving faster than they can be written in the textbooks, again, is always good for uh, patients and of course the providers who are able to serve them. So thank you for foreshadowing that. And I'm also looking forward to see what comes down the pipeline. Absolutely. Thank you, Sam. All right. Very good. All uh, Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of the Fellows Forum. Thanks again to Dr. Chohan for sharing some of your expertise and experiences, and we look forward to touching base soon. Bye now. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.